Hey, everyone. I'm Jason Weiser. And I'm Carissa Weiser. And you may know us from our award-winning podcast, Myths and Legends, but now we've partnered with Cast Media to create a new podcast called Scoundrel, History's Forgotten Villains, a series that tells the true stories of some of yesterday's most fascinating forgotten bad guys. For example, you'll follow the career of Sidney Gottlieb, not only learning that through Sidney and his CIA team, the U.S. literally sanctioned mind control experiments and torture. But the story will open a window allowing you to really feel what Cold War America was like. Each episode will feature a new villain and a new time period you may not have heard about, but really should. So if you like crime, evildoers, and the darker parts of history, join us on Cast Media's new podcast, Scoundrel, History's Forgotten Villains, every week, wherever you get your podcasts. Feet crust, thin crust, what you like the best? Man, it doesn't matter. Pizza's, pizza's all good with me. We'll call what you want on it. I like the pan myself. That's what I'm thinking. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. The, you talking about the deluxe? Yeah. Let's, get, let's do it. About a week ago, I made my way down to Hazelhurst again. I shared a pizza with Milton, and we chatted, for once, not so much about Rhonda. We talked about how humid it's been lately and how Verizon's cell phone service isn't as good as it used to be in the area. It felt good just to hang out. Uh, we want a fit crust, uh, everything. Okay, anything else? Uh, can you do a half order of the uh, pickle uh, breadstick? That's it. I think that's it. This is maybe the fourth or fifth time I've been down to Hazelhurst since I started investigating Rhonda's case, but I could feel that something was different this time. The town felt bigger, more alive. It's the first time I've been here since the podcast premiered, and I've been told that it's created quite a stir, to say the least. It seems like everyone in town is listening along, talking about it. People convene around the proverbial water cooler in the grocery store, the bank, and the beauty parlor, and discuss who they think is responsible for the death of this beautiful young girl. I've heard people have followed along taking pages of notes and plotting out timelines, keeping track of suspects' whereabouts and movements in the story. Hazelhurst is buzzing, and you can almost feel the excitement pulsing through the streets. Facebook and Instagram posts flood the screen on my phone all day every day now. I guess I've rattled the cages, as Milton and Gail had hoped I'd do. There's been an outpouring of love and support for the Colemans all over again they once again are confronted with the love that people in this community have for them and for Rhonda. But along with all that positive energy has come a warning. I've been told that when I'm in Hazelhurst, I should be careful. To look over my shoulder, be aware of my surroundings, which I've gotten in the habit of doing, just in case. But on a positive note, people have begun calling the tip line sending messages and emails with little pieces of information at an alarming rate, so much so that it's hard to keep up lately. People finally are telling things they saw or overheard that they've never shared with anyone. The post-it notes with my jotted-down information have now completely covered my desk and spread to the wall and computer screens. And recently, I was finally able to get in touch with some of the people I've been trying to reach for months. One of them was former Deputy Don Creamer. I did want to get back to you. I'm not trying to dodge you. I've just been, I've just had me a year of it that if I'd have noted getting old would be like this, I'd have took better care of myself or something other. But anyway, Mr. Kaifa, whatever I can tell you or whatever I can remember, you asked away. I wanted to get right to the point with Don. I'd heard so much already about police corruption, multiple suspects, cover-ups, and even that law enforcement officers may have been involved in some way with Rhonda's death. And I'd not heard many good things about Sheriff Mark Hall, who Don worked closely with for years. But one thing I've been told by several people, including Milton, is that Sheriff Hall stated on several occasions before his death in 1992 that he knew who killed Rhonda. He was sure of it. He just didn't have the proof. Well, I think the whole community, uh, law enforcement community, has got a 
a pretty good idea who did it. You know, you don't get but one chance to try somebody. But, you know, everybody, everybody that wore a badge here, myself included, has been accused of it. And my gut feeling, like you asked for, my gut feeling, it wasn't no law enforcement because most of them was called out that night by my wife. And she's been gone nine years now. But, I mean, at that time, we didn't have 911. We didn't have EMTs. We didn't have anything in Jeff Davis County. It was just a little small county. But uh, actually, when the sheriff's office closed down at 5 o'clock, the phones and all was transferred to my home. Remember that Don Creamer was one of the first officers on the scene that night. He arrived shortly after Deputy Leroy Sanders and called in Richard Dees with the GBI. When I arrived there that night, there was a deputy already. Well, you know, I'm not really remember if he was a deputy or a police officer, Leroy Sanders. But he was there along with probably 10, 12, 14 students. That was at the party, the graduation party, if I remember correctly. And when I, I arrived, I... You know, you just had a gut feeling that something was wrong. I mean, because I've known Rhonda all of her life at that time, but, you know, that Cavalier was just sitting there. But Richard Dees probably arrived less than 30 minutes after I did. And, uh, and then, sure, he got there, I don't know, sometime. Well, we I called my wife, and she got all the deputies. They called them at home, and they come out, and we just went to riding the roads about all we knew what to do that, at that time. And you know, the sheriff got there and sort of took over everything. But uh, but we know how this story goes. The sheriff kicked the Hazelhurst City Police off the crime scene for some reason. But Don saying that everyone that wore a badge has been accused at one time or another almost feels true. He says he was accused at one time or another as well for being part of a cover-up. I ain't covered from nobody. I mean, I, I, I think in my mind I know who did it. Uh, I'll probably die. No one, John, done it. It was just hey, so much circumstantial stuff with tying John into it. That's another tick mark next to John's name, if you're keeping count. But when I asked him about Sheriff Hall being accused of covering up information, corruption, drugs, etc. He was one of the finest. He'd give you the shirt off his back and the last dollar out of his pocket uh, to anybody, black, white, or whatever, but... I don't think they was, I just, I just don't, won't never believe that they was any drugs that Mark Hall was involved in as many, as many nights as me and him was laid out here on small marijuana patches like you'd find in South Georgia and stuff like that. I, I really don't. In fact, they tried to tie him in on that case where they, I got an airplane here one time with 300 something pounds in it. And it was Marcy's dairy down at Baxley. They tried to tie Mark into that on federal court and I was a witness in federal court you know they never could I mean the DEA and everybody else worked on it but you know the people just these rumors they keep accused him well take it for what it is but you've now heard two very different opinions on Sheriff Hall and while I can't pass judgment as I never met the man I can say that from what I've dug up in old newspapers and the many other accounts of corruption I've come across it was certainly happening right under his nose, if he wasn't involved. But one other name in law enforcement at the time whose name keeps popping up is Mark Hall Jr., or as people around town might know him, Marky. One confession I'll make to you all is that I've heard Marky's name since the day I started this investigation. But truthfully, I didn't really put much stock in it, because when I asked, why do you think he was involved, the typical response was, I don't know any of that to be true. I just know I've heard the theory. The more that years have gone on and the more things that I have heard through the grapevine, I now am not sure that it wasn't more marky. And that doesn't hold much water with me. But recently, we heard eyewitness accounts from three different people, Chuck and Denise Thompson, who both passed polygraph tests, and Ricky Tompkins or rat. Chuck Thompson claims to have not only seen Rhonda with Marky at the site where she was abducted from, but to have had an altercation with him, and even spoke to Rhonda, asking if she was okay. And while Rat says he didn't physically see Marky, he's positive it was his deputy car parked next to Rhonda's Chevy Cavalier. I had no idea who Marky was other than a name. 
I wondered if he's been listening to this podcast. Has he heard me report that his father may have been corrupt and involved in drug trafficking? Has he heard that I've now brought his name into the story for the world to hear? And if so, what would he say if I called him? Or if I knocked on his door? I got in my car and took a deep breath. I needed to talk to Marky. And now was the time. Uh, it's a uh, Saturday about one o'clock, and I am just down the road from Marky's house, where I'm told Marky lives anyway. And I'm going to go try talking to him, and knock on the door, and he's got no idea that I'm coming. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. It's a little nerve-wracking. I've heard that there's a lot of talk going around in uh, Hazelhurst right now and in the area about my little investigation in this project. And um, things are certainly stirred up down here and kind of like kicking a hornet's nest. So uh, I guess I'm just hoping that he hasn't caught wind of uh, too much because otherwise I don't, I don't think he's going to talk to me. But uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens here. Fingers crossed. How many free trial subscriptions end up costing you hundreds, if not thousands of dollars, long after forgetting to cancel? Fight back against scammy subscriptions with Truebill. Truebill is the new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions you don't need, want, or simply forgot about. On average, people save up to $720 per year with Truebill. Because companies make subscriptions so hard to cancel, Truebill makes it incredibly simple. Just link your accounts and Truebill will cancel your unwanted subscriptions in one tap. And your Truebill concierge is there when you need them to cancel any unwanted subscriptions so you don't have to. Truebill has over 2 million users and helped save them over $100 million. Like Jennifer B., who says, With your help, our family has saved $587 per year on unnecessary subscriptions. I really didn't understand how Truebill could help me until we decided to save for a very large home purchase. So don't fall for subscription scams. Start canceling today at Truebill.com slash true crime. Go right now. Truebill.com slash true crime. It could save you thousands a year. Truebill.com slash true crime. Geico asks, how would you love a chance to save some money on insurance? Well, of course you would. After all, who doesn't love a great deal, right? And when it comes to great rates on insurance for all the things in your life, GEICO can help. Like with insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, and RV. Even help with homeowners, condo, or renters coverage. You could save even more with a special discount when you bundle your coverages. Plus, the easy-to-use GEICO mobile app available 24-hour roadside assistance and more. And choosing to switch to GEICO becomes an easy choice. Switch today and see all the ways you can save with great rates and discounts. It's easy. Simply go to geico.com to get a rate quote or contact your local agent and get started seeing how much you could save. To get to where I'm told Marky lives, I drive down a long dirt road that feels very isolated. And I remember thinking to myself, this is how horror movies usually start off right before things go horribly wrong. I pulled down the driveway took another deep breath, and walked to the door. I knock on the door three or four times before anyone answers. I wait almost three minutes. And then... Hey, how you doing? Hi, bud. Hang on, let me get my... <laughs> Marky answers the door. His full name... This is Mark Hall, Jr. The son of former Sheriff Mark Hall. I'm sure glad you come by because I kept warning it. Now, I had fully expected some six foot four, muscle bound guy with a crew cut to answer and stare me down. But out steps a shorter, slightly stocky man with graying hair. In all honesty, I thought I would get, at most, a few harsh words, a lewd gesture maybe, and a door slammed in my face. But he's polite, extremely polite. This completely took me off guard. And one of the first things he says to me is, I was wondering if you were going to come talk to me eventually. Again, I'm thrown off a bit because 
Clearly, he's been listening to the podcast if he was expecting me. And not to complain, but why is he being so nice to me? Marky agreed to be interviewed to share his side of the story and allegations against him and his father. And one of the first things I asked Marky... Would you say that this was probably the biggest case in his career? Mm. Or uh, Rhonda's, Rhonda's murder? I'm probably so. Yeah. Is it something, because you were a deputy. Yes, sir. Is this something, her case, is that something you guys discussed at home on a professional level, or were you a part of that investigation? No, sir. No. What were your kind of duties as deputy? Because I know everybody sort of had different delegations. The night it happened, I I had worked day shift, and I was at home. In fact, I played with my youngins in the floor. And Bobby Creamer, Don Creamer's wife, called and wanted me to go 10-8. Don needed me. I ask what his duties were as a deputy, and he gives me his alibi that night. Now, listen to the next few minutes of our conversation. Don needed me. And what's 10-8? That means go on duty. And I said, what's, what's going on? She said, just go 10-8, and Don will let you know where to go. And what, what time do you think that was? I don't know. I know it's been 30 years. <laughs> I mean, if you had to guess. Probably 10, 30, 11 o'clock, somewhere in there. Uh, so I went 10, 8, and he told me to come out to Bell Telephone Road. So when I went out to Bell Telephone Road, I saw what's, what's going on. She, he told me he had a, a little girl gone missing. He said, I need you to ride these back roads and see if you see a four-wheel drive pickup and just look for four-wheel drive pick with people in it. So, so even then, they knew right away that there was a truck that they were looking for. Yeah. yeah. Uh, by the time I got there, GBI and all was already there. I, I, if I remember right, may, may not have been, but think, seemed to think they are, or was. Uh, so that's, I left them there and went straight, riding the woods back roads till wee hours of the morning. Even though Marky may have expected me to stop by and want to talk to him at some point, he seemed nervous when we first began talking. I could see him trembling, and at times, I could even see his lips quivering. I don't address this with Marky, but eventually he does, on at least three separate occasions. But he continued answering my questions anyway. GBI came and talked to me here months ago, maybe a year ago, oh, because, of these, because of these rumors. And um, I said, look, anything y'all need, I got bad anxiety, but, you know, anything y'all need. Anything y'all need, I got bad anxiety. Look, I'll give anyone I interview the benefit of the doubt. I think that's just fair. But Marky was clearly nervous speaking to me. And why? I'm not a cop. I can't arrest him for anything. I'm not accusing him of anything. I'm just asking questions. And Marky says that he was questioned by the GBI as well recently and fully cooperated. Just He said, well, I said, I told him then. I said, I'm sure DNA has come a long way since that happened. And he says, yeah, it has. And he said, well, he says, we don't need a warrant. I said, nope. You get what you want. Marky also says he took two polygraphs. And you you take a lie detector test at one point? Mm-hmm. Or a, a, lie dete- a polygraph? Mm-hmm. And I told you I have bad anxiety, anxieties. The first one I wigged out on, I'm being truthful with you. I wigged out on And he said, look, just con-. He said, well, I, gave me, I told him, I said, give me a minute. Let me con-. He said, no, let's just put it off and you do another one. Yeah. So when I come back, they said I passed. And hearing this brought something to mind I'd heard earlier from Chuck Thompson and others, that Rhonda may have been pregnant with Marky's child at the time of her death. You know, what do you say to, to rumors like that? Like, if she was pregnant, that would have proved my DNA. So if I give that fine, so I've never heard no more. If there was any possibility of Rhonda being pregnant with his child, would he have offered up his DNA so voluntarily? If the GBI took his DNA sample a year ago or more, 
wouldn't he have heard back from them by now if Rhonda had been pregnant with his child? But to be honest, I've known this was merely a rumor for some time now. Because several former law enforcement agents told me that Rhonda was menstruating at the time of her death. You cannot be pregnant and menstruating at the same time. Marky says that not only did he and Rhonda not have a sexual relationship, he says he didn't even know Rhonda at all. It's God is my witness, man. I did not know that little girl. You never met her? No. That's right. Marky says he had never even met Rhonda. Tracy Slater, Rhonda's friend from high school, remembers seeing Marky around town all the time. Because he was always around. Like, I mean, it was a small town, so everybody hung out at the store, hung out at Hardee's, hung out at, at I mean, we didn't have anything to do. You rode, you, rode in a, you rode in a circle, but he was always around. I asked Marky about this again. That is based on a statement they made saying that they witnessed you with Rhonda. Is that right? That's a lie. That's a lie. I didn't know the little girl. Okay. So, absolutely no truth. None. We all want love, that happily ever after feeling of finding your soulmate. What if someone not only claimed they could help you find that perfect partner, they guaranteed it? Jeff and Shalia, a young couple famous on YouTube, teach about twin flames, a deep romantic connection with your perfect ultimate partner in their videos. It's a divine love. You're designed for no one else, and they're designed for no one else. But the path to finding your twin flame isn't so simple. Those who start to doubt the group are instructed to cut ties with friends and family that are holding them back and to corner and claim their twin flame through stalking and intimidation. By the time some members are able to leave the group, they don't even recognize themselves and the harassment to rejoin makes them fear for their safety. From Wondery, Twin Flames is a podcast about what happens when the quest for love turns into a dangerous obsession. Follow Twin Flames on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or you can listen early and ad-free by subscribing to Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. I continue on with Marky, asking for his thoughts on the accusations about his father, Sheriff Hall, being associated with drugs or any other type of corruption. No, no. I heard what Roy Robertson said, and that's it's ridiculous. Ridiculous. As much as he hated it, no. Absolutely not. No. Remember, Sheriff Hall was an unindicted co-conspirator in a drug operation. Same question now, but about allegations of deputies harassing or even dating young women. Did you know any of that stuff was going on? No, sir. Okay. Um, never heard that before? No, sir. Really? No. No, I wasn't aware none of that was going on with us. Simple questions, simple answers. For the record, did you have any involvement in the disappearance, the abduction, or the murder of Rhonda? No, sir. Absolutely not. Do you have any idea who did? Or any information that you've never shared? No, sir. I had so many open questions after speaking with Marky. And I'm hoping this isn't the last time the two of us will talk. And as we wrapped up our conversation, Marky shared this with me. People's going to believe what they want to believe, Mr. Cop. The people who know me and my personality know I I couldn't have done anything like that. Wouldn't do anything like that. And I hope, like I told you, I hope this this triggers something on somebody to solve this. And this small town, Mr. and Ms. Coleman is good people. I mean, really good people. Do you think that the rumors that have gone on about you or about your dad, has that affected your... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. In what way? It's cost me a couple of jobs. Really? Yeah. My kids, some friends. But I love this town. That's where I was born. I was raised. I want to stay here. 
I hope this works so I can go to a few people and say, look, sorry. I pray every night, Mr. Kyle, and if, like I told you a second ago, if dragging my name and my daddy's name, I'm sure my daddy would say the same thing, through the mud, it's gonna create something to help Mr. and Ms. Coleman put this, find out who did this. You know, I can, me and the good Lord can take this. I hate it for my family, but I, I couldn't imagine what Mr. and Ms. Coleman's gone through all these years. I just can't imagine. I'm an, I'm an emotional person, and I just, and when you get to talking about Mr. and Ms. Coleman, I just, man, it, my heart breaks. So my youngest is the most important thing to me in my life. I just couldn't imagine something like that happening. I'm sorry. So I did even dragging my name through the mud helps. Go right ahead. It's hard to know what to make of everything I've heard. Don Creamer shares his thoughts on the idea that Marky was involved in Rhonda's death. You know, I've heard over the years, probably 50 times or 100 times, that Mark Hall Jr. is the one that killed Rhonda. But he was home when my wife called him. I mean, she's deceased now. She can't tell you that. But uh, she actually called him at home and got him out along with Donnie Spell, another deputy, and Jimmy Boatwright and all of them. But, you know, Mark. John, Greg, Mickey, and Marky. Four names I've heard more times in the past eight months than I can count. Each one of these men seems to have some connection to this case. But how? Every time the puzzle pieces start to fit, new information comes in, making things that much more complicated. I've heard people make accusations that would destroy any person's reputation, especially in a small town. And so far, Marky is the only person that's been willing to speak with me, and the only person that we've heard anyone publicly back and say they stand behind their belief in his innocence. But then again, Don Creamer worked in the same police force for the same sheriff that we've heard very derogatory things about. So what's the truth then? How do we find the answer to the Coleman's now 31-year-old question? Who killed our daughter? I was relieved to finally have the chance to talk to Marky but I still had so many questions for him and about this case. And when we talked, episode seven of the podcast had not come out yet. He had not heard what Chuck Thompson and Rat had to say about him. I didn't know if he would talk to me again, and I planned on calling him once I got settled back in Atlanta. But Marky beat me to the punch, calling me on Thursday, August 26th. And unlike our first conversation, Marky was fired up. And he had a lot more to say. You need to talk to some more people about these two boys you got now. You need to talk to some more different people. Chuck Thompson and Rat. Everybody I talk to about them said they're pathological liars and peel heads. How would you explain him and his wife both independently passing polygraphs saying that they saw... I can't explain it, but I know for a fact that he is lying. I was not there. That's a fact. I give I give my DNA, I, I've done everything I could. And I was real, I got real, I got a real emotional. My anxiety took up, but I'm getting mad now. I, I, this time I'm going on the offense. I couldn't, I can't, it hurt so bad that Mr. Miss Coleman would believe I had anything to do with this. And then once again, While I put this episode together, I received calls from two more eyewitnesses that claim they saw something the night of Rhonda's disappearance. And they saw Rhonda just minutes before she disappeared. One of these new eyewitnesses has asked to remain anonymous. And the other has agreed to speak on the record. So I I pulled down the dirt road and I could see the headlight, I mean the blue lights on the cop car so I went down and standing there beside Rhonda's car it was his car his car was parked behind Rhonda's with the lights on with the strobe lights and all on 
her car was sitting there still running with the lights on. I asked him, said, what's going on? And he said, well, if you don't want to get in bad trouble, you need to leave. You need to leave now. So I backed up and I left. So I took that, knowing his family and the way things were at that point in time here, I took that as my, my warning to get the hell out of there or, or I was going to have something happen to me. And I'm willing to say all this under under a lie detector to prove that I'm 100% truthful about everything I'm saying. And I would say it under oaths. Fox Hunter is a production of Imperative Entertainment. It was created, written, and reported by me, Sean Kipe, and I wrote the original music score. Executive producers are Jason Hoke and Gino Falsetto. Story editor is Jason Hoke. Sound engineering by Shane Freeman. Key cover art provided by Joe Freeman Jr. Keychalis 9032, 2015. JoeFreemanJr.com Fox Hunter is a 10-episode series available every Tuesday morning. Follow us on social media at Fox Hunter Podcast. If you like the show, leave us a review and tell your friends. Thanks for listening.